2012, in a school in New South Wales, a rumour started spreading among the kids. Apparently, there was a dirty young girl, about 12 years old or so, who lived in the bushes. That girl was pregnant and didn't know who the father was. Well, she had an idea. One of her brothers, for sure, one of the ones who used to rape her. Close your doors, turn your lights off, and let's get started. Today's cruise to the dark side will start in New Zealand and its capital, Wellington. Because of its remote location, the islands of New Zealand were the last large habitable lands to be settled by humans. Between 1280 and 1350, Polynesians began to settle in the islands and then developed a distinctive Maori culture. In 1642, the Dutch explorer Abel Tasman became the first European to put foot on New Zealand, starting the westernization of the islands. First, through the 1840 Treaty of Waitangi between the United Kingdom and Maori chief, declaring British sovereignty over the islands. In 1841, New Zealand became a colony within the British Empire and in 1907, it became a dominion, gaining full statutory independence in 1947, and the British monarch remained the head of the state. Today, the majority of New Zealand's population of 5 million is of European descent. The indigenous Maori are the largest minority, followed by Asians and Pacific Icelanders. The Gold Clan was a big family, with five generations living all together. Uncles, nephews, cousins, brothers, fathers, mothers, sisters, almost 40 members. One big family unit, sticking together through the best, but also the worst. They weren't the kind to settle in the same place for a while. Nomadic in their way of life, they went from place to place performing at town halls, festivals and country shows, and even produced records with album covers. One of them, called Love Songs, featured the patriarch of the family and three children. At their head was June, the mother, born in 1948, and Tim Colt, born in 1943. Until their death in 2001 and 2009, they were taking care of the whole family. The couple met in New Zealand, where they were originally from, and married in 1966, before deciding to move illegally to Victoria in Australia in the 70s. The happy couple had seven children together, Martha, Frank, Paula, Cherry, Rhonda, Betty and Charlie. From the 90s, the family was known to frequently relocate mainly between South Australia, Western Australia and Victoria. They did so whenever locals became suspicious of their bizarre activities. Activities that mainly involved incest. That grew the family to that staggering number of 38, majoritarily formed because of the incestual relations. Starting with Betty, whose father, Tim, raped since the age of 12, resulting in multiple pregnancies, in her case, 13. But she wasn't the only one benefiting from that extra special attention. Her sisters as well were pushed, forced and raped by their fathers, brothers, sons, you name it, creating the most complex family tree. Martha ended up having six children, same for Rhonda, and the same goes for any female in the family. Generations of inbreeding 
resulted in more and more noticeable physical deformities, such as slug ears or misaligned eyes and balanced features, and they looked decades older than their calendar age. Many had chronic renal failure, acute glaucoma, pneumonia, and heart problems. Some of their children didn't even make it past a couple of months, such as Sally who died from Zellweger syndrome, which is a result of cosanguinity or close relations between the child's parents, a rare and fatal genetic disorder. It is discernible by a thick, short neck and low-set ears, which Sally presented with. The baby, in this case, was the result of the relation between the siblings Tammy and Derek, children of Betty and Tim. But the inbreeding, as it turns out, started even before Tim's repugnant tendencies. June herself was the fruit of an incestual relation between a brother and a sister. Even though she was unaware, her daughter Betty, in 1997, found out after a DNA test. She mainly wanted to know if June could be a potential kidney donor for one of their daughters, discovering the root of their family tree. In the family, the display of sexual behavior at a very young age was common and even encouraged by the older members, particularly Betty, who approved the rapes. Impregnated as soon as they reached puberty, girls weren't allowed to seek medical help or abort to avoid any suspicions. They were pushed to lie about the paternity of their children. Often, they were forced to have their offspring in the most horrible conditions and to keep their mouth shut. School, hygiene, safety, education was the least of the family's concern. Most children didn't attend school and were illiterate. They were malnourished, dirty, had no available toilets or running water. They didn't know how to use a toilet or a toothbrush or toilet paper. Living in their own waste, most suffered from fungal infections. Because of the neglect and absence of any sort of education, but also the inbreeding, one 15-year-old boy had the cognitive level of a 5-year-old. Many of the children could not read or write and those who could were functioning well below their age level. The children included a boy with a walking impairment and severe psoriasis, another with hearing and sight problems, and a third boy whose eyes were misaligned. A nine-year-old girl could not hear or write, had stunted speech and was unable to bathe or dry herself. The kids spend their time roaming around the forest, not having any sort of toy or anything to just occupy themselves. Some tortured animal that they found on the farm, mutilating their genitals as a pastime. Other girls were hiding from their cousins and brothers, wanting to rape them, even though they couldn't hide for long. Trapped, they were accounts of girls tied to trees and raped. But even adults participated, conceiving even more children, growing the family further. With most adults being jobless, the family mainly relied on social security payments, including disability and family support, with rarely anyone checking on them to see where the money was going and if the children were well taken care of. In late 2009, after the death of Tim, Betty and her brother Charlie took on the family's lead and settled in a farm near Burua, New South Wales, about three and a half hours southwest of Sydney. It was accessible by a series of roads, which disintegrated into just dirt track, keeping them away from civilization and chances of being discovered by mistake. But they also had no access to electricity, water or sewage. Charlie Colt and his nephew Cliff partially cleared the land and the cold women, mainly Betty, in her early 40s at the time, and Martha, aged around 29, set up house. The living quarters consisted of three old caravans, two sheds and two tents, one of them being used by Martha and her partner Charlie, who was also her brother. 
a filthy makeshift kitchen was there as well, but it was rarely used seeing the state of malnourishment of the children. In the children's corner, next to their beds, but also on them, there were buckets full of urine and feces. None of Martha's children attended the local primary school. But some of her older sisters, Betty and Rhonda's 18 inbred children, did, which started the rumor that put a halt to the ever-growing family members. For two years, authorities received seven reports of risk of significant harm, but never acted on them, until that rumor of a pregnant young girl. Then, an investigation was opened in 2012, discovering the horrors they lived in and through. On June 6, 2012, case workers and police arrived to inspect the farm and reported children who were dirty and wore dirty clothing, and who were unable to make eye contact, their speech was difficult to understand, and they had very poor dental health and hygiene. The cold adults were at first asked to fix the exposed wiring, broken windows and dangerous stoves. And the next day, caseworkers returned with two camping toilets and showers. By the following days, there had been a significant cleanup, but the game was up for the knowing colds. On July 18, 2012, farmers watched a convoy of police in four-wheel drives. A police bus and an ambulance drive up an old stock route out of town towards the scrub of old bush ranger territory. The authorities removed 12 of the cold children on the farm, but also Tammy's and her brother Derek children who lived alone in another location. Putting several children in foster care, but trying to keep as many together to avoid causing more trauma, the family were charged with incest and child neglect. But the new matriarch, Betty, legally disputed the charges and attempted to regain custody. Contacting her son, Bobby, through very flirtatious texts, coming up with a plan to abduct Billy, her other son, from foster care. For that, she was jailed and deported, since, just like her parents, she was in Australia illegally. However, she fought deportation and was released in November 2015, living in South Australia. While in care, the horror of the children's life became more obvious. The kids started talking, although incomprehensibly, about the life at the farm. For the ones who didn't or simply couldn't talk, their behavior betrayed the terrible truth about their sexualization at a young age. Children as young as five years old tried to kiss social workers, were masturbating in front of them, and casually talked about different sexual encounters they had with their family members, or even the adults between them that didn't hide. The most difficult to understand were Rylene's daughter Kimberly, Betty's daughter Carmen, and all five of Martha's children. One of Betty's son told carers it was a family rule not to tell anyone their father was in fact Betty's father, because Betty could go to jail. Out of all children, only Cindy, Rhonda's daughter, was considered to be an intelligent girl, who apparently wasn't the result of an incest. In 2018, Betty, Charlie, Rhonda, Roderick and Marta, but also Derek, Cliff and Rylene were charged on different accounts. Martha Colt was given a maximum two-year prison sentence. This was because she lied about the paternity of her children, who DNA testing proved all to be the product of sexual relations with a biological relative. She still maintains, though, that her children were born from five casual encounters, which is demonstrably untrue. Like Martha, her older sisters, Betty and Rhonda, but also Betty's daughter, Rylene, were also charged with lying about who was the father of their children and received sentences between 14 and 16 months. Of the original 80 charges leveled against the eight Colts 
including incest, child sexual abuse, indecency against a child and perjury. Many were dropped. Roderick was found guilty of raping his niece Petra during a week's holiday at the Burwa farm. After a fight with Betty, her mother, Petra went for a walk and was dragged by Roderick into his car and forcibly raped as she fought him off. He then threw her and her clothes out of the car and called her an ungrateful bitch and a pig. Petra would say her uncle Charlie had also sexually assaulted her from when she was a child and had been told again to keep her mouth shut. Petra was Roderick's niece, but she was also his half-sister. Petra told the police in 2013 that she had never gone to school, she lived in a cult, and that all her aunts and uncles and cousins had been sleeping together. The case has been described as unique because of the reluctance of the victims to come forward. But also at the point they found the men, they were all criminals but at the same time victims, living and raised and continuing on a path they were put in by mainly Tim Colt. The fractured Colt family, despite the fact that they're scattered in different parts of Australia, still stay in touch via Facebook. Some of the children underwent treatment programs for sexualized behavior and psychological trauma and ceased contact with their relatives. But the pool of the family ties is evident in their social media exchanges. In 2016, Martha posted on Facebook a plaintive message with her mobile number and a photograph of her son Albert, saying she was still looking for him. This accompanied posts of videos made by two of Martha's sons, Jed and Carl, and three of Betty's sons, Billy, Brian and Dwayne, claiming that they had been bashed and beaten while in care. In 2018, Betty Cold posted on Facebook a picture of herself with two female relatives, with a superimposed message declaring, Love makes a family. Now adults, Few of the entire cult clan are employed, and if so, they do manual jobs like fruit picking. Most of their sexual habits faded with time, but the result of their closed family indoctrinement still leaves them scarred and hardly able to function in society and build connections with other people. The cult clan is one of the worst cases of incest that Australia had known. Cold is not the real family name. Same goes for all the other names that you heard in this video. They were altered in order to protect their identities. I hope you enjoyed this new story. Until next time, stay safe.